So it's going to be contentious. And then obviously, you know, you have a, a governor with his own political problems and that's that it is what it is. But the governor has always operated where he was very influential and very powerful in this process. So I don't think that's going to change regardless of the context. But I know that myself, many of my colleagues in the majority, many of my colleagues in the Senate, we're going to push to make sure that our communities get the money that they deserve and that there is money particularly to help schools reopen as quickly as possible, get people vaccinated as quickly as possible so we can reopen this economy um, at full tilt and hopefully just uh, be able to just recover in a way where this state has never seen, at least in our lifetimes. So that's good news for um, for nonprofits that have been at the forefront of yeah. combating COVID mm-hmm. and dealing with mm-hmm. everything that COVID highlighted. I know that it was um, it was it was it was obvious last year was a rough time for for um, for funding for yeah. funding of nonprofits, but given that they've played a, such an important role in, in the last year, mm-hmm. um, they seem, it, it, it seems to be that they're going to be in a good place. That's my hope. Man. I, look, I think there's, there's that fantastic- screaming, that screaming is Liam. So that's fine. I, I, I got kids of my own. I'm, I'm, I'm actually in Albany, so I, I get it. No worries. Man. <laughs> so look, that's my hope. I, I think, Ultimately, you know, I have fantastic community-based organizations in my district. I work with Davidson Community Center. I work with the Shield Institute, um, you know, Morris Heights and their non-for-profit um, arm. There is just a lot of community, uh, uh, there's a lot of community-based organizations that I've done uh, a lot of work with that help, that help get people food, help get people masks and PPEs, help people process uh, hardship waivers so they can stay in their homes help them get access to legal services as well. And these organizations have done just incredible work under very, very difficult circumstances. And I applaud them. And I think really, it really goes to show when we do budgets and we talk about tax cuts for this industry and that industry and that they're gonna bring jobs. And you know, a lot of that stuff is not really essential. What really is essential are these community-based organizations who, you know, like, like no alternatives to children who work for, um, you know, uh, for populations that need a lot of support and need a lot of help and getting them through this pandemic, they were absolutely essential to make sure that that happens. And those organizations are essential. And I know for us, we're going to continue to push for them, support them and get the funding that they need. There's, there's, there's many nonprofit organizations that do have portfolios that deal with um, senior living, senior sure. citizen assistance. Mm-hmm. And given the, the lack of information that the governor uh, provided, how has states and, and organizations been able to pivot to actually deal with this issue? Well, that, you know, there's the, that's like a couple questions in one. Like, I'll try to tackle it in sort of the best way that I can. The only thing that these organizations can do was work with the information that they had and work with the resources that they had, which is not new for a lot of these organizations. They have to make, you know, a dollar out of 15 cents, right? The, so that's, that's not new. The nursing home issue, right? It was a lack of transparency for the executive in terms of getting us information. And then some of these operators, uh, these nursing homes who, uh, weren't transparent in their, in their dealings with the governor or with every, anybody else. So we were able to rectify that specifically on nursing homes where we were in session for hours discussing several uh, uh, bills that dealt with transparency, dealt with the for-profit nursing home sector, dealt with reporting and information to the legislature and removed uh, an immunity provision that was included in last year's budget that basically shielded nursing home operators for um, uh, willful and negligent deaths on their properties uh, due to, you know, COVID or uh, infirmary or disease. So, 
you know, if you're talking about the not-for-profits that deal with sort of a senior population, for example, you know, Morris Heights has a has a housing facility, a senior housing facility in my district on Birdside. They were very open. They were very transparent with me. I've had <laughs> dozens and dozens of conversations with them. And part of that with them particularly was that they did a lot of work with not a lot of information and not a lot of resources. And I commend organizations like that, like Morris Heights, particularly Morris Heights Health Center and their senior living facility. There were other operators that didn't do as well. And I know that in the, in the, the, uh, the bill package that we passed in the last couple of days, including today, we're gonna help rectify that. But ultimately it doesn't bring back the folks who died out of negligence um, or just uh, lack of care from the state. And there's nothing that I can tell those families to bring those loved ones back. But what I can tell them is that we as a state are going to do what we can to rectify the situation so that it doesn't happen again and it doesn't happen um, in the future to any other family. Since we, uh, since we last spoke, um, mm -hmm. given the climate then, what's happening now with, you know, getting back to normal sort of, you know, we have, we have the vaccines that are, that, that are out. Um, how has your district been doing since sure. then? So, well, look, I mean, we've been seeing anecdotally and in terms of uh, data that particularly communities of colors across the board um, were most impacted by the pandemic, uh, received the least amount of resources in terms of testing, which we are correcting and rectifying, and that they're slow to receive the vaccine for X amount of reasons. My district isn't any different. Um, I've been working with the state directly. I've been working with, uh, with local government, with the city of New York, to make sure that there is vaccine parity for my, my constituents. And we're working to do that. We're working with community-based organizations like Morris High Health Center, uh, the Institute for Family Health, uh, Union Community Health Center, um, and to a certain extent with Montefiore to make sure that people get the vaccine. The biggest issue that we saw was there was a lot of food insecurity, right? And the thing what we were able to do is not only expand food access, either through your pantry system, um, in my district, but also work with local schools to make sure that food was accessible uh, to families, whether or not it was during the school school day, which was helpful. Um, but really right now, what, what my community needs is making sure that they have the opportunity and the ability to go back to work. So supporting the small businesses, particularly in my district, one of the most heavily impacted uh, uh, sectors were the bodegas, the uh, hair salons and the, the barbershops, and the livery industry, right? So making sure that they're inoculated, make sure that they get the vaccine, get access to PPE, PPP uh, resources. And as the federal government uh, passes its next uh, round of relief, um, that they get access to that uh, those resources as well, because those are essential businesses in my community that support and employ a lot of my neighbors and getting those industries off the ground and continue to support them is going to be paramount to making sure that our econ that that the economy locally in my district continues to to recover. Um, any sort of pushback on for people like receiving or distrusting receiving the the, the vaccine? I think it's, it has, there's been a, a certain element of that. Um, there's two things that are happening actually with that. Um, one, obviously the federal government hasn't had, particularly government in general, hasn't had a really good track record in, in interacting with communities of color, particularly with experimental medications and drugs. Um, you can point to, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen experiment, you can see, you can point to a lot of things, right? That have treated, particularly people of color and uh, particularly black people as guinea pigs in medical experiments. Um, but with that being said, right, there's sort of a strange phenomenon and it kind of makes sense in the, in the society that we find ourselves in is that people are starting to feel like fo are, are starting to feel FOMO in not getting the vaccine. Right. So you see someone on your social media feed, they're taking a selfie, getting the vaccine. It's kind of like, Oh, you know, you went to the beach, uh, I want to be there, that kind of thing. So it's, so it, it's sort of, it's a problem that's almost fixing itself, 
and you know social media actually is playing a role in that but at the same time we're still not dealing with the actual generational issue that the federal government has to come correct and come right to our communities government in general has to do that and the mistrust that exists is real and it's true and should be respected and the concerns of our community should be taken into account when we do this and i and i hope that um, as we move out of this, these conversations continue um, and that people who need help, medical or otherwise, get access to those resources because not only do they need it, they deserve it. So speaking of PP, PPP, mm-hmm. um, one of the major problems that occurred in the first rollout last mm-hmm. year was small businesses not receiving any any help. Sure. Um, and speaking to a couple of your colleagues in, 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 in government, mm-hmm. um, it was expressed or, or noticed that there's many small businesses that have their accounts with smaller banks, right? Mm-hmm. So they don't have their, um, they don't have their accounts with Citibank or, or, um, yeah. um, chase or, you know, to name, to name, to name a, a couple. So, Perfect. From that, and and since given given that you're the, you're the chair on banking now, um, how has that is that problem been addressed? Is it being worked on? What's going on? So we're dealing with this issue on two on two fronts, right? We're dealing with that in the context of the budget, right? We're putting more money, state money, into lo- small local community banks to make sure that they have the resources that they need to dole out this cash. Also, in my conversations, uh, uh, particularly with uh, uh, Majority Leader Schumer's office, uh, one of the things that they want to do is, you know, as you mentioned, the problem was in order for someone to get access to the PPPs in the past, they would have had to have existing client relationships with these larger institutions. Right? So that was the big problem. And it shut out a lot of the businesses that uh, exist within our communities. So there's a lot less restrictions when it comes to that. Obviously, there's safeguards. You don't make sure people who don't deserve these loans get access to these loans and their mechanisms in place to make sure that doesn't happen. But there's less of an emphasis on that. And they're, they're spreading the pie larger so that smaller community banks get access to these funds so that they can lend out to these small businesses. Because again, these small independent banks and these community banks are the ones who deal with the day-to-day for the most part with a lot of these small businesses. And those are the ones who develop relationships with the local community and they should be able to have access and opportunity to these resources uh, to make sure that it gets out to the community. As far as, as my role as the new chair of the Committee on Banks and the Assembly, one of the things that I've worked with um, and I've had conversations with them is, again, making sure that not only small businesses, but you know regular, uh, regular constituents and, and, and communities get access to financial instruments, um, savings accounts, checking accounts, Um, that help them build wealth and obviously, you know, take banks and large financial institutions to task who have traditionally um, sucked out uh, resources and wealth out of our communities for the sake of a profit. So it's a, it's a long-term conversation that needs to happen. And I've engaged in those conversations with these organizations. They've signaled a willingness to work with me and, and my counterpart in the Senate, Senator James Sanders from Queens on this issue. And we shall see. I will hope I plan to hold these folks accountable and make sure that, you know, that they stick to their word and they invest in our communities and have a physical presence and do business with with our small businesses and with with my neighbors. What other sort of, what are the things within within the banking committee um, that y- you and your you and the, and the other members are spearheading that maybe the general public are not aware of? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's this conversation that's been happening for a while in the state on this issue of public banking, right? And it's a lot more complex than, you know, the the basic premise of public banking is that a local municipality or state sort of issues a charter for, for a bank that is solely controlled by the state, right? Uh, the closest model that exists right now that's actually been 
fairly I've been fairly productive and fairly helpful and for for a long time has been the Bank of North Dakota. And I encourage your listeners to look that up and talk about sort of what their fiduciary responsibility is to the to the shareholders, which are the people of the state of North Dakota, um, how it actually functions, what does it do, what does it do, what does it doesn't do. Um, the bill that we're trying to pass here in New York is kind of a different take on it. It's allowing municipalities to create um, the ability to institute a public financial institution. Um, and what that would do is it would give immediate access to liquidity to small businesses through sort of a public lens. And that these institution or this institution would be not accountable to shareholders, but accountable to the public. That we need more of that, right? So, you know, there's a lot of conversations that need to be had. Um, there's a lot of concerns, especially from the private sector on this issue that I've been engaging on. But I know myself and my, my colleague in the Senate are, are committed to doing this in some way, shape or form. And also what people need to think about um, in terms of banks is as, as, as far as the state charter in the state of New York is concerned, there are organizations and institutions called CDFIs, which are uh, community development financial institutions. CDFIs, their mission, um, according to the Community Reinvestment Act, which was a federal legislation that was passed in the 70s, has a fiduciary responsibility to invest into communities and get access to capital and financial instruments to certain communities, particularly underserved, low to moderate income communities. Uh, some large banks participate in the CDFI model but mostly it's small local community banks who get certified through the state charter to do this kind of work. And they have an obligation to stay in our communities, invest in our communities and do business in our communities and be a part of our community. So a lot of it, again, and I say this in full disclosure, Ricardo, I, I knew about banking policy and financial policy, but with this new, uh, assignment that the speaker gave me, I've been sort of just tearing through the books on this and just learning more and more about this. And it's been a lot, but I'm committed in using this position of power to help our neighbors get access to money and build wealth. Cause that's kind of what this can, this uh, committee can do. You're also a member um, um, on the committee of higher education. What are some of the things that you see that, occurred during this last year through mm -hmm. virtual learning and everything um, that you feel like going forward will modify the delivery of higher education? So as far as higher education is concerned, I think whether you attend a CUNY or a SUNY, uh, a community college, a four-year school, a private institution, a for-profit institution, I think, you know, there was some balance less when we went to college but more now that there was there was a, a there was a more emphasis on an online component and then as the the uh, pandemic sort of came online there was even more and it sort of took out took up most of the way that a, a, a person would get an education so it wasn't a new concept i think the the big issue i think was sort of with prime uh, a primary school, uh, elementary school education and high school education, where there is not that much of an element. And speaking as a parent, uh, this year has been a, a colossal pain in the ass with trying to, you know, keep an eye on, a, on, a, on, on my oldest daughter so that she can go to school. But I don't envy her. And I feel bad for a lot of for her and a lot of her peers who have to go to school and sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day to get their instruction. And I think if anything, I sort of feel like because we moved to an online model, the concept of snow days are gone. So I feel bad for them on that. Um, there, if Department of Education, at least in the city of New York, stays on top of this sort of aspect and be able to transition quickly, um, there's more ways where students can receive instruction, but this shouldn't be a substitute for that. As far as higher education is concerned, in terms of access to technology, we need more of it. We, as part of a financial aid package, I think, and I was a beneficiary of this when I was a student at the University of Buffalo many years ago, 
where part of my financial aid package was getting access to a computer, right? Just to do my work and be able to sign on to, build, to Blackboard and, and, and do my online classes, at least that one online class that I took. And that should be more and more of a part of it. And, you know, and I know that myself and Chairwoman Glick uh, and many of my colleagues who sit on the higher ed committee have engaged in this conversation. But I think really just, I think what we're gonna focus on right now is just getting people back in the classroom back in the lecture halls, back in front of professors and teachers so that the, the traditional way of instruction where we have learned for millennia uh, continues to happen with sort of a much more sophisticated way of delivering education uh, through uh, online means. But again, it's more of a supplement than a, than a substitute, I, I, I would say, just for all, for all our sakes, to believe me. There's going to still be an apprehension of going into a full classroom, yeah. right? Um, and so even with attendance, if there's going to be a, a bigger push to virtual learning, how do you think like schools will, 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 will be addressing how they, how they generate met revenue? Very good question. I think it's sort of like you have to sort of think about what the funding model is going to be uh, moving forward for the either the state, the city, the private uh, higher education system um, in New York. What my gut tells me is that right now people are eager to go back into the classroom. I think physically just interacting with, with colleagues and classmates, I think people miss that. And the younger you are, the more resilient you are, as, a, as particularly children, they just love hanging out and being around their friends and socializing. It's great for their mental health and their physical and emotional development. And just being back in the classroom for us, it's gonna be great. As far as higher education is concerned, the problem that we've always dealt with is that the state of New York hasn't fulfilled its obligation in terms of funding uh, for decades at this point in terms of higher education is concerned. So we have to bring up our percentage and funding and less emphasis on raising tuition to make up that gap. And one of the good things that we're trying to do in the assembly, and I hope you bring in one of my colleagues from the Senate to talk about what their perspective on this, is that we are trying to raise the TAP award like significantly and then what we're trying to do is we're trying to pay down the tap gap. And for folks who aren't familiar with it is basically as the cost of tuition rises and as the tap award flatlines, the difference between your tuition and what your tap award gives you, there's a gap that continues to increase year after year because we're not increasing the award. So that's what's called the tap gap. And what we're trying to do as a state, at least as far as the assembly one house is concerned, the budget, the, the, our budget proposal that we're gonna put forward, we're gonna increase TAP by a lot. So each individual um, awardee is gonna, you know, if we were to pass our budget, again, if this is in context, I don't want people to believe that, oh, we passed this giant TAP increase. But if we were to pass our budget, our one house as the budget, as it would stand, people would see an increase of $1,000 in their TAP award. And then on top of that, what we would do is we would pay down over the course of the next three years, that TAP gap, which is the operating aid that SUNY and CUNY's difference would be with the TAP award. So not only would they get more bang for their buck in terms of what they can afford, textbooks, room board, whatever, but also that it meets the obligation for CUNY and SUNY so they don't see or feel the need or even have the legal right to raise tuition on students. So as far as funding is concerned, whether it's online or brick and mortar, I think it benefits institutions to physically have students on their campuses, attending their, their classrooms, going to lectures in, in on campus, but also because we transitioned so far in online learning I think there's going to be hopefully more opportunities for learning for students um, in terms of like, you know, like for example, you know, you have to take that one sociology class, but they only offer it at night and you work, right? And you can take it. Let's say you go to a CUNY or SUNY, whatever, but maybe they offer an online equivalent during the mornings, or you can just take the class when you can. So there's, there's, and there's going to be more money put into that. So I think that's a benefit. And on, on, and at the end of the day, 
SUNY and CUNY are a public good, and we should make sure that they are funded appropriately and they provide a public good uh, to New Yorkers or anybody who wants to attend uh, one of these prestigious institutions. Given from where we started to where we're at now, I mean, how do you feel about the outset or the outlook for what the what what you're looking forward to? I mean, personally, what I'm looking forward to is visiting family, seeing friends that I haven't seen in over a year. Um, you know, during this pandemic, I had a uh, my wife and I had our second daughter, so that was fun. And, you know, a lot of my family members, my sister-in-law, my, 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 my brother-in-law, my aunts and uncles, they haven't been able to see the baby. So we're looking forward to, to seeing family members that we haven't seen in a while. I think, I think what's really going to be telling in terms of the mood for the state and for the country is really how the summer is going to play out, right? There's more and more vaccines that are coming online. Um, although it is still difficult to get an appointment if you're eligible, the, that sort of supply demand discrepancy is going to settle over time. And most people will be able to get a, an appointment to get their vaccine by the end of May, if you believe what President Biden is saying. So if that is the case, when people get vaccinated and as CDC guidelines change and more and more permissible uh, gatherings are allowed under state regs and federal uh, 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 recommendations. I think that's really just gonna, it's going to help people a lot in terms of just realizing that the, the worst of that pandemic is behind us. We're getting back to, you know, if you want to go travel to another state or, you know, see family or go to Disney or whatever that you can um, enjoy time, enjoy life with your, with your family, with your children, and I think that's going to in, that's going to have a very positive effect in the mood of the country generally. And you know, as more and more jobs come back online, particularly in the restaurant industry that has suffered significantly, and people can go out again and 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 just enjoy, um, you know, those type of amenities. It's going to be uh, it's it's going to be very hopeful. It's going to be a giant relief, and. Uh, I think that a lot of people are going to, you know, be in a much better mood uh, just generally. And I, and I, and I hope that I'm right on that. And, you know, it's going to be one of those things where we're just going to have to wait and see, but I know that I'm doing the work to make sure that that's possible. I know that I've been working uh, with my offices and my colleagues and making sure that people get access to vaccines and testing and, all this other stuff that is necessary. And, you know, just honestly, I think the summer is going to be really telling and what the mood is and how people kind of perceive and see uh, how we recover and we move past and beyond COVID. Hopefully, honestly, hopefully I'm right. So is there anything that you'd like to finish with? Listen, man, I, I look, I personally, I, I genuinely enjoy uh, these interviews, you know, between you and I and, and the work that you're doing with some of the other members and community leaders, I think it's a fantastic conversation. Uh, if you're not doing a podcast, you should. Um, and I think really what I would, if what I should tell folks is uh, there are resources out there for people. Um, people can follow me on social media at vpachardo86 um, to get access to those resources. They can call me. We're here to work. Um, and I'm doing everything that I can as a legislator, as a New Yorker, uh, to make sure that we come back stronger, more resilient, and that we take these opportunities and build a much more just and fair society where, you know, it doesn't matter where you were born, whether you were born in, on, in Soundview or in, or in Washington Heights or in Morris Heights, to get a fair shake and a fair shot. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna continue to do what I can to make sure that that happens. Assemblyman Victor Pichardo, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. I know how hard you work. Um, and especially when you're talking, when, when I get to talk to somebody about banking and finance and, and stuff like that, because that all, all that stuff is over my head. But um, both, man. Dude, <laughs> again, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy up there in Albany. Um, and um, 
I can't wait for the day that we could, you know, sit down and probably watch a game or something. I don't know. I'll buy you a beer, man. First round's I, on. I love that idea. All right, man. Appreciate your time, bro. We'll talk take, soon. Take care, man.